My name is Frank Deere. I'm a past president of the Canadian Association for Studies in Indigenous Education. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, Windat, and the Mississauga of Credit at U Credit. Um, today's uh, panel uh, is uh, a presentation uh, that is titled Remembering Our Past, Rethinking the Next 150 Years and Beyond, of course, in response to the 150th anniversary of uh, the nation state that is Canada. Um, but in order to get us started in a good way, I would like to call upon Catherine Tamaro, who will open the event. Uh, Catherine um, is a tradition keeper and the communications officer for the Wendat of Anderton Nation, which is one of the four nations of the Wendat Confederacy. She is also a multimedia artist, teacher of various, in various capacities, and an experimental musician whose works focus on issues of community, uh, a continuum, and spirit. And it's a pleasure to ask her to uh, open our event for us. Now go. Oh. Oh. As we move through these important and challenging discussions, we know it is essential to acknowledge all that supports us so that we can proceed in a good, grounded, and mindful way. Along with the treasured gifts of intellect and wisdom that we share today, come the capacity to acknowledge our ancestors, our hearts, and the natural world as our foundation which we live through in such a surrounding beauty. We stand alongside these great lakes and between these two beautiful rivers, around us the unseen realms, and we remember and thank all those who in our own ways and traditions are helping to bring clarity and understanding for us and the next generations. Please tune in with our open heart and mind as we connect with our deep selves in reciting the words before all words. Yano Mok with a Thanksgiving voice. Greetings to the natural world. Today we have gathered and we see that the cycles of life continue. We have been given the duty to live in balance and harmony with each other and all living things. So now we bring our minds together as one, as we give greetings and thanks to each other as people. Now our minds are one. We are thankful to our mother, the earth, for she gives us all that we need for love. She supports our feet as we walk around the planet gives us joy that she continues to care for us as she has from the beginning of time. To our mother, we send greetings and thanks. Now, on the hands of the We give thanks to the waters of the world for quenching our thirst and providing us with strength. Water is life. We know its power in many forms, waterfalls and rain, mists and streams, rivers and oceans. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to the spirit of water. Now, on the hands of us. We turn our minds to the fish life in the water. They were instructed to cleanse and purify the water, and they also give themselves to us as food. We are grateful that we can still find pure water. So now we turn to the fish and send our greetings to the fish. Now our minds are now. We turn toward the vast fields of plant life. As far as the eye can see, the plants grow working many wonders. They sustain many life forms. With our minds gathered together, we give thanks and look forward to seeing planet life for many generations to come. Now our minds are joined. With one mind, we turn to honor and thank all the food plants as we harvest them from the garden. Since the beginning of time, the grains, vegetables, beans, and berries that help people survive. Many other things draw strength from them too. We gather all the plant foods together as one and send them greetings and thanks. Now our minds are joined. The medicine herbs. Now we turn to all the medicine herbs of the world. From the beginning, they were instructed to take away sickness. They are always waiting and ready to heal us. We are happy there are those among us who still remember how to use the plants for healing. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to the medicines and the keepers of the medicines. Now our minds are one. We gather our minds together to send greetings and thanks to all the animal life in the world. They have many things to teach us as people. We see them near our homes and in the deep forests. We are glad they are still here and hope they will always be so. Now our minds are born. 
We now turn our thoughts to the trees. The Earth has many families of trees who have their own constructions and uses. Some provide us with shelter and shade, others with fruit, beauty, and other useful things. Many people of the world use a tree as a symbol of peace and strength. With one mind, we believe and thank tree life. Now our minds are one. We put our minds together and thank the birds who move and fly about over our heads. The Creator gave them beautiful songs. Each day they remind us to enjoy and appreciate life. The eagle was chosen to be their leader. To all the birds, from the smallest to the largest, we send our joyful greetings and thanks. Now our minds are one. We are thankful to the powers we know as the four winds. We hear their voices in the moving air as they refresh us and purify the air we breathe. They help to bring the change of seasons. From the four directions they come, bringing us messages and giving us strength. With one mind, we send our greetings and thanks to the four winds. Now our minds are one. We turn to the west where our grandfathers, the thunder beings, live. With lightning and thundering voices, they bring with them the water that renews life. We bring our minds together as one to send greetings and thanks to our grandfathers, the thunderers. Now our minds are one. We now send greetings and thanks to our eldest brother, the sun. Every day, without fail, he travels the sky from east to west, bringing the light of the new day. He is the source of all fires of life. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to our brother, the sun. Now our minds are one. We put our minds together and give thanks to our oldest grandmother, the moon, who lights the nighttime sky. She is the leader of all women all over the world, and she governs the movement of the ocean tides. By her changing face, we measure time, and it is the moon who watches over the arrival of children here on Earth. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to our grandmother, the moon. Now our minds are born. The stars. We give thanks to the stars who are spread across the sky like jewelry. We see them in the night, helping the moon to light the darkness and bring dew to the gardens and growing things. When we travel at night, they guide us home. With our minds gathered together as one, we send greetings and thanks to the stars. We gather our minds to read and thank the enlightened teachers who have come to help throughout the ages. When we forget how to live in harmony, they remind us of the way we were instructed to live as people. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to these caring teachers. Now our minds are one. Now we turn our thoughts to the creator of the great spirit and send greetings and thanks for the gifts of creation. Everything we need to live a good life is here on this mother earth. For all the love that is still around us, we gather our minds together as one and send our choice words of greetings and thanks to the creator. Now we've arrived at the place where we end our words. Of all the things we do, it was not our intention to leave anything out. If something was forgotten, we leave it to each individual to send such greetings and thanks in their own way. Now our minds are mm -hmm. Now I'll go up, Catherine, for your words. Mm -hmm. um, the older I get, the less frequently I have occasion to hear the Ahanda Dario Dekwa, which was just recited. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, hear uh, frequent reference to the people, Umba as the as, as, uh, address references. Aguego, um, Muska, Adida Wala, Noni, we're all here as a single consciousness. And that narrative, uh, I trust, will inform uh, a great deal of what we do, not only today, but elsewhere. Um, and it's also what Sam Harris recently in America said uh, in response to the need to um, transcend trouble, to address issues, and to live harmoniously with one another. And he says, all we have is conversation. And in a sense, I, I believe him the importance of respectful dialogue about things that are relevant to such things as reconciliation is truly important. And this year, Canada 150, is something that I think merits a great deal of uh, exploration about our past history, how we interface with one another, and how we move forward through, among other things, education, 
formal, non-formal, and informal in their forms. Uh, so uh, in putting together a panel that explores that, uh, I have to acknowledge the co-sponsors who have made this possible. The Association of Canadian Deans of Education, the Canadian Association for Social Work Education, the Canadian Historical Association, the Canadian Sociological Association, it's a lot of associations, eh? <laughs> the Canadian Society for the Study of Education, of which I'm a proud member, and the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences and providing interdisciplinary <coughs> funds in support of this event. Um, and it's the Federation and other relevant um, contributors to the conversations that are academic and non-academic that I think we can all uh, um, benefit from. Uh, this is a topic that is current, but it's a part of this, uh, if you will, TRC 65, if you want to have an incisive look at calls to action, or the TRC report and calls to action as a coherent whole. Um, and uh, I'm happy to uh, introduce some speakers who will speak to that uh, today. So I'm going to ask them to join us on uh, the stage here. Um, We have three panelists planned for today. Uh, we are waiting to see if the third does arrive, so we'll, we'll see in due course if that occurs. <laughs> oh, I have a big gap in the let's, middle. <laughs> let's huddle together in fear here. <laughs> somebody perhaps you've seen before, um, a gifted orator who has begun uh, working in and around universities over the last few years and has contributed to dialogues associated with children in care, children and youth well-being, and other related issues. Uh, he's a dedicated teacher who specializes in reaching out to non-traditional students to provide more pathways into post-secondary education as an ed engaged instructor with the University of Winnipeg's Faculty of Education. Uh, our first speaker has developed expertise in groundbreaking mentorship and inclusion <coughs> programs with Indigenous education. Uh, you may know that he is uh, a frequent uh, face in the media and he's been part of a wonderful podcast where he has been working under the auspices of a very experienced faculty member from Manitoba. <laughs> 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 he's a student, he's a doctoral student at the University of Manitoba. He's the Associate Vice President of Indigenous Affairs at the University of Winnipeg, and I'm proud to call him a uh, very close friend, Kevin Lammer. Kevin. Well, thanks for introducing yourself, Frank. I appreciate that. Bonjour, Anin. Hogama ma igin indigenikas. Migaji nido dem. Kishimigwich nidinawe maganadak. Hmm. Niminoya. Kaye nimimundam. I want a new gum. Mino gijigad. My name is Kevin Lamaru. I am the Associate Vice President, Indigenous Affairs at the University of Winnipeg. And it is a great pleasure uh, to be here with you, all of my relations, on such a beautiful Toronto day. Um, it's nice to be able to gather with, with colleagues and with friends, and I recognize so many faces. Uh, I can say with all sincerity that I'm truly humbled to be here, especially because I know that most of you were here to see Pam and not me, so I'm really humbled <laughs> to be here. I was thinking about doing this presentation with Dr. Palmiter and, and of course, Lee Miracle, and, and now Jane here. I'm thinking, holy smokes, I've really got to step up my game. I, I'm thinking that as people write about this event, they're going to talk about all the big names, Jane and, and Lee and Pam and that other guy that was on the panel. And so I, I'm, I'm bracing myself for that disappointment. But in all audience, uh, in all honesty, I'm, I'm used to being kind of a consolation prize. You may know this, that I came into my role as AVP at the University of Winnipeg, filling the shoes of uh, the Honorable Wab Kanu, who left that position to go into politics. And so I'm used to disappointing people. So this is nothing new. <laughs> To me, when you, when you walk in the shadow of the very, uh, the very wise, the very uh, handsome, the very charismatic Wab Canoe, you've got you to get used to that. 
I have uh, another consolation prize. In, in terms of, 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 you know, sort of dealing with that, you know, I, I, I can take some relief in the fact that with, with Dr. Deere being on the panel, at least there'll be somebody who's a bigger disappointment than me. So I can live with that <laughs> in all things considered. That <laughs> I can make my peace with my, my, my role to play. Now I say that, and I got to acknowledge that Dr. Deere is in fact one of my PhD supervisors at the U of M. He didn't mention that, so. He was. <laughs> I want to, uh, I want to acknowledge the, our, our elder who opened us up in a good way. I, I hadn't heard that reading before. Obviously it's one that uh, Dr. Deere is familiar with, but walking into a space and smelling the, the, the smudge, the burning, and seeing the elders and seeing so many friendly pace, uh, faces at a university that I've never been to before uh, reminds me of the gift that I have to be able to come into a space and, and pursue a career in academia, standing on the shoulders of people like Dr. Batiste and others who are here, um, and the space that's been created for a young Indigenous scholar like myself to be able to be in a space and feel ultimately safe. And, and I'm going to frame my conversation primarily in terms of that lens of safety. But before I get into that, before I get into anything too heady, and because I have a couple more minutes now to, to share with you, I thought I would start with a story. Now, I started my career in education, and I am very proud to come from education because I've always operated with the belief, perhaps this is cultural, perhaps this is just an expression of my humanity, that we all carry a sacred duty to love and care for kids above and beyond anything else. And to be honest with you, the older I get and the crankier I get, I, uh, I have less and less patience for anything that gets in the way of that fundamental responsibility to love and care for kids, be it policy, be it programming, be it anything else. Uh, I'm losing my patience for that. But I do come from education and I am always excited to be able to talk about my experiences in education. And I've always been attracted in education to working with the kids that struggled the most in school. Perhaps because of my own journey through education, being a young half-breed from the north end of Winnipeg, where it was not advantageous at that time to come from mixed heritage, to be able to come from a neighborhood of poverty and to be able to share that experience. Um, perhaps it's just because I'm so excited with that experience of seeing previously undiscovered talent shine through. But I've always been attracted to working with those kids, which always brought me into the heart of the north end. And my career followed that trajectory even into academia. For a while, the University of Winnipeg had an office in Winnipeg in the North End. And if you don't know anything about Winnipeg, you'll understand that that's a city that has one of the highest percentages of Indigenous people living in an urban centre in Canada. Uh, the North End in particular is one of the most economically challenged post -co postal codes in all of the country. Uh, and we had an office right there. And what was neat about this neighbourhood, aside from the richness of the experience, was how often you would see kids just everywhere in this neighborhood. And there's this uh, particular story that I, I heard about, about a young girl from that neighborhood named Kathleen. Now for anyone that's ever worked with uh, kids, particularly indigenous kids, you've met kids like Kathleen before. She carried all of the wreckage of the broken relationship that we've been trying to address through reconciliation. She carried that in her family history, in her genes, as our elders call blood memory, as scientists in modern academia are referring to as intergenerational traumas. However we label it, this kid was uh, not starting from zero, she was starting behind the starting line. I was told that at some point in time her father, who had been a second or third generation gang member himself, was pulled out of their apartment in the North End by the Winnipeg City Police in front of all of the kids, which you can imagine would be very traumatic. She had lived with the poverty and the experience of going to school without watching other kids that have while being the one that doesn't. She went through the experiences of moving from one house to the next. Coincidentally, uh, I've been working quite a bit with kill, uh, children in care in Manitoba. It's one of my areas of passion. In Manitoba, we have one of the highest rates of children in care in the world. And you didn't hear me wrong. I said in the world, about 95% of whom are Indigenous. And one of the things that we've learned about working with kids in care is that every time we move them from one place to another, they lose about four months of schooling before they can get their head wrapped around being in a new location again. If a kid moves two or three times, you can imagine what happens to an academic here. And this young kid, Kathleen, was another kid that had been moved from one location to the next, living with poverty and all of those challenges. And in dealing with the, 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 the bullying and all of the threats of violence and being surrounded by the drug culture and everything that comes with living in that environment, 
I'm told at one point in time she took solace in being able to buy a puppy from one of the neighborhood yards where somebody was selling puppies from a litter. I'm told she paid two dollars. Now our office was on Selkirk Avenue, 485 Selkirk Avenue, and there's a back alley that ran directly behind our office. You can literally look out my office window and see that back alley. And I'm told that she was walking down that back alley early one morning with her puppy on a leash and she encountered some other kids carrying the same hurts, the same blood memory, the same intergenerational trauma, the same deleterious effects of poverty, the same wreckage of the broken relationship, the same desperate need for reconciliation in an authentic way. Except they were expressing that a little bit differently. They were expressing that through bullying. And I'm told that these kids surrounded Kathleen and took her puppy away from her. And then she climbed up a tree with the leash that was left behind and ended her own life right behind my office where I could see that tree from my office window in a moment of desperation. The last hurt being her puppy being taken away. And I remember I got to school that morning. I walked into the building as I always had, stepping over homeless people uh, sleeping on the street, stepping over the drug paraphernalia of the night before. And I walked into my office and I realized what was going on in the back alley immediately behind our billing building and I looked out and I saw what had happened and I became aware of the story and I, I realized what was going on and I have to tell you that in that moment my heart absolutely it, it just broke it just broke it just fell and of all the times that I've been able to offer other teachers a sense of hope or a sense of optimism in that moment I have to be honest with you I had none and I was overcome with this powerful feeling that I haven't done enough okay? I don't know how many of you have ever had that experience or that feeling of watching somebody that you care about in education, or even a kid that you don't really know, trying to get one step ahead in something in the world around them, pulls them two steps backwards. I don't know how many of you have had your hearts broken by loving and caring for a kid that survived tragedy, or in this case, hasn't survived tragedy. Um, but I was at a low spot, and I thought I haven't done enough. And I had people come up to me and tell me that, oh, it's not your responsibility, you work at a university, there's CFS, there's the police, there's all these other agencies, there's all these other pe people that are responsible, you don't have to carry that for yourself. But again, I've always operated from the belief that I have a sacred duty to love and care for kids, even if they're not my kid. That those kids just have the same amount of right to the same privileges that my child is enjoying. Okay? And so my heart was broken and I've been trying to wrap my mind ever since, and this is going back well over a decade ago, um, what more we can be doing as educators, and particularly now that I work in academia, what role do we play in the lives of a young person like Kathleen? What role do you and I play after leaving CSSE in trying to contribute in a meaningful, non-token way to reconciliation? Right? I think that's kind of the, the point. Now, I'm, I'm absolutely certain the fact that there's standing room only in this room, that we're all of a like mind. I don't suspect that I have to sell this to anyone. But I would invite you to consider the possibility that while we celebrate Canada's 150th, while we celebrate here at CSSC all of the good things that we have accomplished, as well we should, to remember that there is still a desperate need for this to play out in a very tangible, in a very real, in a very concrete way. Right? When I took over the role of Associate Vice President at the University of Winnipeg, one of the things that I took responsibility for was the U of W's commitment to what we're calling indigenization. Now, before anyone gets upset, I understand all of the complications with the word <laughs> indigenization. Make no mistake, I've heard it all before. Uh, in fact, I share many of your concerns. I'm going to be honest with you, when I applied for the job, I knew that I was going to have to say something intelligent about indigenization. I mean, it's one of our five strategic directions. But I'm also going to be honest with you, and, and I, you know, it's going on the internet, I, had no, I, had, I didn't know what the hell it was, to be honest with you. So I had to figure out what indigenization was. And so what I did was I, I reached out to people in my community that I trust, people that I look up to, people who are leaders, people who are knowledge keepers, people who are, are more powerful thinkers in this regard than I have asked them. What might this mean? What does indigenization represent? I know that it's a Western word. I know that it's a verb. I know that it implies that we're moving towards some place where we're not currently. I understand all of that, that we're trying to accomplish something that hasn't been done before. But what is this thing? And as I began to reach out to people in my community and ask them the question, what is indigenization, I got back the same answer almost consistently. I'll share with you that Mr. Rai Moran of the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, another dear friend of ours who won't mind me sharing this with you, when I asked him what indigenization might mean, uh, immediately he said it's about safety. He said it's about safety. 
And I said, well, what do you mean? Can you expand upon that? And he walked me through his thinking, and this isn't going to be a surprise for any of you. What he said is basically this. For many young people, many young people like Kathleen, many indigenous people who live in communities affected by the impacts of the Indian Act, by colonization, by the intergenerational traumas of residential schools, for many people being at home isn't necessarily safe. Remember that we have one of the highest rates in Manitoba of kids in care on the face of the planet. All right? And the dysfunction that's created by a parent being <coughs> robbed of the opportunity to learn how to parent, now trying to parent a child of their own, and how we've learned studying trauma that for each generation that isn't able to do its healing work, that uh, that dysfunction can pick up momentum from one generation to the next, right? To be at home sometimes isn't safe. And then kids leave home and that might not be safe, right? Think about a young kid walking down the back alley with her puppy. Think about the fact that we learned just a couple of summers ago in Saskatchewan that if your car breaks down and you pull into a farmer's field looking for help, somebody might shoot you. Sometimes being away from home isn't safe. So at the very least, if we invite Indigenous students onto campus, into the academy, guarantee their safety. And of course, I'm not just talking about physical safety, which is the bare minimum. I'm talking about cultural safety. The safety to be able to come into a space and smell the burning of the smudge. Right? and not have to answer for why we allow that and not other religions, which is an absurd argument that's well played out past its usefulness. To be able to express ourselves culturally with identity, to be able to hear each other's languages, to be able to share our stories, sometimes to be able to have space to grieve. Hey? I don't know how many of you who are Indigenous or non-Indigenous in this room who have learned about why things are the way that they are in Canada and I've had to leave class and go find a quiet place on campus just to go and have a cry. I have. Sometimes it's about that too. Right? So for me it's all about safety. When I think about urban education, when I think about youth, when I think about what truth and reconciliation might think, mean, I'm thinking about this concept of, of safety. And I'm thinking about young kids like Kathleen and how we create the pathways into university so that before she ever gets to that desperate moment she knows that there's a safe place waiting here for her with us, a place where we can create the kind of programs with that talent that hasn't maybe necessarily shone through to begin to sparkle, so that our lives are made richer for the contributions of young Indigenous people who are just dying to enrich our world with a better understanding of the living world of each other from a cultural perspective. Those young people that want to see our nation reclaim its dignity and move into the kind of country that should have been our birthright. Right. And so, in wrapping up my thought, because I know that I'm out of time here, I simply want to say miigwech, miigwech nibawa. Thank you to all of you. I do recognize that I'm surrounded by allies, and I do recognize how difficult this work is. Um, how grateful we should be that we're all in this together. Hey, I've been doing these presentations for a long time. There was a time in my career where this auditorium would have been near empty. And now look at all of you. Hey? I didn't do enough for Kathleen. But together, we're going to work to ensure that that need not happen to any other kids. As Cindy Blackstock has so eloquently said, we're going to let this be the last generation of kids that have to heal from their childhood. I hope. Miigwech. speaker is Judy Eisen. Thank you for joining us, Judy. Judy is uh, an adjunct professor at the University of Alberta. She is the recipient of many uh, research grants. She's a former Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Knowledges and Research. That was her initial uh, appointment. And then subsequently uh, was Canada Research Chair in Indigenous mm. Education uh, in that second term. Uh, and she is from St. Albert, Manitoba. So, Miao Go for joining us. Albert? Thank you. <laughs> Did it work? Ah, oh, it there worked. Yay! <laughs> it's always a thrill. Can't <laughs> say.
Kas ka tu es vas kasus ko elnia? Vapis te nu tsenia, Mr. Sakai ka nu tsenia. Thank you for this opportunity. What a beautiful panel to be invited to. Um, that happened two hours ago, so I'm doing my best here. <laughs> You're a tough act to follow, so I'll do my best. Um, yesterday I gave a, a talk about truth and reconciliation uh, on a panel, and I've taken just 10 minutes of some highlights out of that talk to share with you today. Um, it comes from the work that I've been doing um, with uh, my own community, uh, um, which is St. Albert, Alberta, <laughs> just to correct you, and um, yeah, you did. <laughs> you said I'm going to be in Manitoba, I know. <laughs> so I've been working with elders for about 15 years, um, mostly Métis elders from our uh, various communities in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and, and British Columbia, and uh, I've been doing research with them on storytelling. <coughs> and we began the research, I, I began the research with my great aunt, who uh, has been doing, or had been doing about 30 years of research in the archives and into our community. She had this big pile of historic photographs and she wanted to know who they were and what they were about. And so she spent 30 years and before she passed, um, I went out and I recorded her audio and then I actually got a videographer and we actually recorded her video. And we told the story of her own family. But in the story of our family, we're Métis, we come from St. Albert now, but we came from the Red River Basin, um, we came from all across, we came from Quebec. And so I made a film about my aunt to capture <coughs> some of those stories. The elders tell us we need to know who we are and where we come from. So that was part of the work that I was doing in that project, uh, recording my aunt. Um, from there, I began to record other elders telling their stories. Uh, I did a women's project um, recording el women's stories, uh, female elders, um, including Thelma Shalafu, who was the first identified Aboriginal and Métis woman in the Canadian Senate, um, Elma Desjardins, who was um, and is uh, a beautiful woman, and who uh, an elder and a teacher and a healer in Alberta, and my aunt's story. And she tells the story of our ancestors, particularly the women, and their gifts of healing. Uh, I come from a long line of healing women. Um, so there's some beautiful and powerful stories in the work of these elders. But the elders I worked with last, um, I made four films about <coughs> them, uh, which are on my website, um, and you can take a look at that. But what they really talked about was the need to um, record our stories and our knowledge systems. So I'm going to shift now and talk a bit about that work, and then I'm going to go back to talking about the elders. The Truth and Reconciliation uh, was a government-sponsored an indigenous directed research program and I think you'd probably know that. Um, the schools, into the schools that forcibly incarcerated many generations of children. 120 years of violence was inflicted on our communities and they were not just First Nations communities, they were Inuit communities, there were Métis communities directly affected, um, particularly in Western Canada, um, the Métis communities. So the report made broad sweeping recommendations as you all know and it's probably the biggest reason why many of you are here and they wanted us to indigenize. In my experience in recent years I'm quite concerned about this notion of indigenization because I think it largely talks about superficial changes but it doesn't talk about the deep and rich changes we need to make as institutions and as organizations to actually make change in the lives of families and communities. And so I'm, I'm going to talk to you a bit about um, recognizing indigenous knowledge systems. It seems to me that that's really the level at which we need to be thinking about and talking about this work. In my work, the elders share their stories and expertise through collaborative dialogues in the Michif language. And they, these were recorded in audio and video, and I'm going to share some of those with you in a few minutes. Um, the outputs of this community-based research are intended to support educators, families, and communities in the education of children and youth about Métis epistemologies, ways of life, and about language. 
it's important to understand that when we articulate the concept of land in indigenous languages, it's truly fundamental so that we can accurately understand this concept because when we do it in English, we just don't get it. Land is the interaction between location and residence, including relational, experiential, and spiritual elements. There's a relation between knowledge systems, culture, values, and the lands occupied. So building upon relational accountability then includes fulfilling a role and obligations and being accountable to your relations. And I think we started there this morning and I thank this beautiful elder for sharing that story. I haven't lived on this territory for a long time. I haven't had the opportunity to hear that, but I thank you. It touched my heart. And now I'm touching the mic, I don't know. <laughs> this notion builds upon indigenous relational epistemologies, teachings, all things that are related are connected in dynamic, interactive, and mutually reciprocal relationships. And I think that's what that story is about. My understanding is the, the long version is 14 days? Uh, it can be. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so these relationships are captured in the language of indi indigenous people. They draw upon multifaceted processes. They encompass and create spaces of belongingness and sovereignty, and I'm sure within that, spaces of safety. They work in relation to and with land through time and space and they focus upon the future of communities. So it's pretty much a big tall order for us as educators. So more than a dec decade ago I began working with these elders and, their s and hearing their stories. They are storytellers, educators, healers and community leaders and their stories teach us respect. Respect for ourselves, respect for our communities, our elders, our, our neighbors, and respect for all life, and the knowledge systems in which we dwell. And it seems to me that that is the crux of the problem when we're talking about indigenizing. Because their powerful teachings that aid us in knowing who we are are not necessarily safe within these institutions and we need to change that. So the work I've been doing is on indigenous digital storytelling and it provides a way to honor these traditions and the ancestors. And one of the elders, and I'm just gonna bring you a short piece, of, but this is Tom McCallum, <coughs> White Standing Buffalo. He's a Sundance Lodge keeper, an elder, an advocate of the Michif language and a healer. And I'm grateful to him for many years of support and sustenance that he's provided me, I've learned so much. He's a very wise man. I have many pieces of brilliance that I could bring to you from him because he truly is a big thinker and a big feeler, beautiful heart, <laughs> an important vehicle um, that he uses for his teaching is language and culture and the stories he tells. So it's necessary for us as, a, as educators, as community members, um, to think about culturally located stories in Canada. We need to actually locate these things. We still s keep seeing these sort of um, stories that, that don't have any groundedness. They're not connected to this place and we really need to do that. So I'm going to give you just <coughs> one of his brilliant stories. Um, it's about three, three minutes because I was told I had ten in total. <laughs> but I have many more. Um, but I'm going to just bring you one for now. Kawan <laughs> Mutimina, Pick up a young 
Now, normally I talk a lot about the Machif language at this point, and then I give you some more brilliant uh, expressions from Tom. But at this point, I'm just going to talk about the fact that he's really talking about teaching the endangered language, its value in our communities, and the, its contribution to knowledge in the world. I believe this is a very significant process that these elders, all of them, have been talking about. His example shows us the disruption of relationships to self, to language, community, and land that were undertaken through this residential school system and other parts of the colonial system and the basis for the attack on Métis and other indigenous people. So Tom highlights the need to reestablish these relationships as a way of reconciling self, family, community, and land through language and story, as well as spiritual practices. Métis have long bridged the relationship between First Nations culture and knowledge and colonizing culture. We in our languages, cultures, and homeland have been the rainbow link between these cultures and language systems. <coughs> Looking at our mixed languages, understanding our strength of drawing on parent cultures to develop our own culture, and creating unique and new knowledge in the spaces between have created a rich and diverse knowledge system that has enabled proliferation of many generations of Métis. So our stories, our language varieties, and our cultural knowledge is evident that we can reconcile ourselves, our families, our communities, and our relationship to other cultural groups, <coughs> to build societies that are strong, diverse, respectful, engaged and continually evolving new and unique opportunities. I posit that this is, is our goal in education, is to create spaces for that kind of transformation. So thank you for this opportunity. amongst others, as we look at this question about where we are at Canada 150, where we are in the process of reconciliation, where we are in regard to PRC 65, among others. Um, we have this issue of safety. Uh, I do know about Ryan Moran, and we've had some lovely discussions about how to uh, consider the university as a reconciled space. Um, and there are a number of things that are important to that, not the least of which is ensuring that uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples have a space in which to engage with one another in an honest, 
and a respectful way. That's very true. But also, after in those addresses, is something that I think um, might be the proxy for understanding the struggles of indigenous peoples. One of them, anyway. And that's of language. If you've uh, given yourself an opportunity to look at some of the research that's gone on over the last decade and a half, two decades, not the least of which was the Heritage Canada report a few years ago that said all but Cree, Anishinaabe, Moen, and Anakitut would disappear in a few uh, generations, uh, then you might begin to understand the crisis that occurs right now. I call it a proxy because many indigenous people um, do see language as one of, not the, but one of the more important ways of storing information about ourselves, our, our relevant and important ways of sharing <coughs> our stories about our ancestors and about ourselves, and they do, if you will, uh, codify culture in a very important way. Um, so the work that's been done by Judy and others in the area of language, uh, revitalization, language sustainability, and actually understanding language itself is also very important. Um, and with every community discussion that I have or I'm a part of, and with every committee, school district committee that I'm a part of that explores indigenous languages, time and time again, families, community members are uh, very, very anxious about the possibilities uh, for language uh, programming and are waiting for school districts and universities of Jesus to support them. Uh, but they also appreciate something else that's very important, and that's community participation in that process. So what's ahead of us as members of the university community is that enabling ourselves, enabling our students, and to be supportive of the process that we just people in the community are on in order to meet the next 150 years in a way that's relevant to their own cultural identity, their own nationhood, and uh, to their views on uh, reconciliation and other things. I know reconciliation and the TRC is a focus of many of these talks, but uh, we're at one stage in that process. Uh, it seems to me that there are a number of conversations that have to happen, both formal and informal, over the next little while that will condition that also. Um, I'm, I'm sure the discussions around missing and murdered indigenous women and girls is going to rightfully so condition the conversation about our relationships with each other. Uh, among other things. So uh, I think although those are tough stories to be had, I think they're important to have. Um, so I wish to offer some time uh, over the next few minutes, because we are coming up against it, uh, for questions to our two panelists. So I'm happy to sort of field those now. As a linguist working uh, with many communities uh, across Canada to document and preserve and revitalize Aboriginal languages, I think something really interesting comes up from the <coughs> presentations, and I think it's to establish a connection between safety and language. Mm -hmm. um, where are safe spaces to speak Aboriginal languages? Successful academics these days, indigenous academics, usually are rewarded for mastering English, not an Aboriginal language. I have mentoring, I am supervising and mentoring Aboriginal students who are still fluent, and there is no reward in the system for struggling to find ways to have that knowledge of the language be recognized in an education degree program. Furthermore, now that's academia, that's us, but also in the communities. I have another Christian right now who stopped speaking at age eight because her grandmother told her that she was not speaking properly. And there is a lot of things happening in the indigenous community that do not make speaking the language safe because it has changed so much between generations. It's like your grandmother speaks Shakespearean English and you speak modern English. It's like the change has been so quick that you have 500 years of language evolution that has taken place. There is huge work to do to debunk wrong ideas about bilingualism. <coughs> we have teachers going around telling parents, stop speaking to the kids, because you're going to undermine their chance to succeed in school. That's in the back where kids are still going to be in La Romaine right now. That's what you heard. So myth about bilingualism, mm -hmm. like bilingualism is not good, where research shows it is good. 
and, and also the, the question, so I'm, I'm throwing up to you, I thank you, this is great inspiration for me, the connection between safety <coughs> and language, how to create everywhere safe space to speak the language within communities and in academia. Maybe you want to, you can maybe spark something new, I think something to say about that, I'm not to hear you Absolutely. Can I go first a second? I want to think about it. Go ahead. Okay. Can you, uh, can you hear me from here or do you want me to go to the mic? Okay. So as I was saying, I think that... <laughs> um, I, like, f first off, we, I, I feel almost uh, ridiculous. We have Dr. Marie Batiste sitting right up yeah. here, and, and everything that I've, I've learned about revitalizing indigeneity through education, I've learned from Dr. Batiste. I think the first thing I would recommend is go and buy every book that she's ever written and try to, tr try to learn from, from her. Secondly, you being a, a linguist, um, you, you will, um, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not telling you anything else, uh, anything new, um, but let me offer this as, as a point of conversation to respond and to honor the, the, the very wise um, statement that you made. Um, it, it, language is synonymous with a couple of other things as far as I'm concerned. First off, language is synonymous with culture. They mean the same thing. Um, the best definition of culture that I was ever given was given to me by Dr. Martin Brokenleg, who said that very simply, culture is that which seems normal to you. Now, I invite you to think about that for a couple of seconds, and you'll recognize that as simple as that sounds on the surface, there's nothing simplistic about that. Because if it's normal for me, for you it might be, who knows, depends on if we share the same normal. Uh, but culture and, and uh, language are synonymous to me, uh, insofar as we can't revitalize culture without revitalizing language. Simultaneously, if we honor language, culture will be vibrant. But it's also synonymous with something else, which is power. Uh, language is synonymous with power. Uh, and what I mean by that is that um, there's a tremendous amount of, of privilege or disadvantage that comes with certain language. So for example, the first time I traveled up to Nunavut and I was looking through the magazines, it, I hadn't realized this, this is how ignorant I was living down south, that the citizens of Nunavut can request service in their own language. Meaning that functionally there are um, at least three official languages in Nunavut. Functionally is what I mean. Think about what that means for young people who grow up <coughs> speaking language. All of a sudden they're born with something that is marketable. Something that comes with economic opportunities. Something that comes with pathways to guaranteed employment. Something that comes with a sense of pride and a sense of being able to contribute back to family and to be able to support family through the exercise of just being what you were born with. Which is something that many in Canadian, uh, Canada have enjoyed without even realizing it since the day that they were born. Right? Um, it's been argued that Canada is just as much indigenous as it is anything else. Um, that we are just as much indigenous as we are British or French, you know, a place of gathering for people from around the world. Um, I think to be able to explore this notion of language revitalization is central to, to reconciliation. Uh, the only other thing I would point into this is that there's a big difference, I think, between safety and safety. And what I mean by this is that when I began to talk about safety on campus, uh, immediately there were forums of people that were saying, in modern culture, oftentimes people will use that phrase as an excuse not to engage in difficult conversations that challenge their point of views. Do you understand what I'm saying? And they'll invoke the idea of a safe space to avoid having to be brought out of their comfort zone. I'm not even going to comment on that at all. I have no opinion on that whatsoever, publicly speaking. <laughs> Before I get attacked on Twitter. But I will say this, that's not what I was talking about. I wasn't talking about avoiding tough conversations. In fact, we are at the University of Winnipeg, one of two universities in, the, in all of Canada that offers an Indigenous course requirement requiring all learners to take at least one course of Indigenous content. We're not avoiding tough conversations. But what I am saying is that we as academics inherit a system through no fault of our own that has been complicit with colonization. 
And so it's also incumbent upon us to find pathways to decolonize that work, which I think is the spirit of what you're getting at. Our work in the university is largely conducted in and of English. It, it accepts the English norm as the dominant story, and it suppress, continues to suppress indigenous languages and knowledge um, in all of its aspects. So it seems to me that what you're really talking about is transforming the space to make it accessible and available to students. I know uh, when I was at OISE, we talked about could a student write their dissertation in the language? Could they prepare that and would that be acceptable? And at the time, it was not particularly uh, accepted and they probably would have to also present it in English. So it was a double burden. But um, we've talked about that for many years and I think it's time for us to push that boundary. I mean, at one time, um, students were, who wanted to give, you know, to follow pr protocol and, and give tobacco when they were doing research got attacked. Today, we accept that that's standard practice, that when we work in communities, we use protocol, whatever they are in that particular community, and that's just an expectation. But 20 years ago, that was something that was problematic and, and a, a barrier. So I think it's not an insurmountable task. I just think we've got a lot of work ahead of us. I'm, I had a conversation with Sagesh Henderson yesterday, and he was saying how, you know, in this whole notion of indigenizing, we've been doing this for a long time, <laughs> and we're still doing it, because we've, we've made progress, and we have, but there's a lot of work to do, and language is one of those um, things we need to work on. So, yeah, go ahead. I just want to add another thing that you learned on the fact that for indigenous speakers who are in Quebec, Mm -hmm. whose colonial language is French, mm -hmm. there's an additional barrier. Yeah. There is an additional protection because actually the, the language is stronger because English is not as strong. Yeah. But if they want to venture into academia, they can't read your papers. They can't write a dissertation. Well, the literature is in English. Yeah. And the very strong message that's given to them is it's not enough to have become bilingual, say, in or articulate with French. They can't make it in the academic world if they now do, don't master English. And I've seen a number of them dropping out of academic programs because suddenly they were forced to read a whole literature <coughs> which they couldn't access. So it's yeah. very tough. Yeah. But, um, it, it is a difficult challenge. Um, I, I take an inspiration from Gugi Wathiongo from Kenya, who at some years ago decided after writing for 20 years in English decided, I'm done. <laughs> I'm gonna support my community in my language. And he began writing in his own language and he said, all these other people who want to write, read my work, you can translate it, but I'm gonna write in my language. And I think that that's a powerful statement and I think, I think if we can move towards that uh, amongst our communities. I'm working uh, with a publisher and we're actually writing a Machif book. Um, <laughs> it's going to be a tough challenge, but I, I, uh, I think with the elder stories in the language, I think it's a, a necessity. But again, as an academic, I don't know if anybody will acknowledge that work because it's very, very hard. Um, but we'll do it because it needs to be done. Hmm. We have time for one more question, perhaps. Sure, thank you. <coughs> I, uh, I don't really have a question, but I do have a statement, and I want to thank Frank and Judy and Kevin and our elder. Um, as a graduate student coming into the academy as an Indigenous graduate student, not only do I feel a sense of place in the room, um, but I, I thank you for your courage and your vulnerability of sharing. Because what you're doing for us is you're modeling what it's like to be at in the academy. And that's what we struggled with as students going through public education. And so we need the mentors and the role models and the elders to help us with this work to come behind you. And so I want to thank you very much for your time as you're doing this for everybody here, modeling what reconciliation looks like so we can come and be a part of this with you. Perhaps a good 
place to to uh, put, close. Uh, you know, it's been lovely to hear the, uh, the uh, insights of our two guests. Thank you for coming, but I will ask uh, that you stay seated just for another moment to allow uh, Catherine to uh, uh, close the event. Great spirit, ancestors, grandmothers, grandfathers, we thank you for your wisdom, truth, and your legacy. Nguyen Nyakwe, by way of the blood, sharing what we've learned, sisters, brothers, teachers, scholars, participants. We thank you for your open hearts and your minds, for your wisdom and your dedication to this renewal, rebirth, and reconciliation. No.